Have you guys ever planned a feast, a banquet? When you do that, it's usually to mark a special occasion, isn't that true? It's going to be something that you want to set apart from other times. So chances are it's going to be somebody's graduation, maybe a milestone in your life. Probably the thing that comes to my mind first is a wedding. And we've had three since I've been here or in Russellville with the congregation. And each time, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Uh, The first thing is, is that you, you take care to prepare the place. I mean, we heard earlier today through the Holy Spirit speaking through Pastor The truth is, look, when you're saved, you are then with the Lord. That's the truth. At that moment, you are there. But you understand also, as we gain an insight into through Ephesians, the place was made for us before we were made. Isn't that true? Look, God said, Genesis 1.26, let's make man in our image and our likeness. If you want to unlock the whole thrust of what God is up to, I think you can boil it down to, one, God is a family. That's the nature of God. God isn't a singular. You know, when you run across that and you see in Genesis where it says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, God already exists as a family. And if you like to wrestle with logical things, you know that must be so. Because John explains God actually is love. Not he behaves lovingly, he does. That's true. But it's not an attribute or a characteristic of the way that he acts in the world only. It is actually who he is. But you know how love works. Love does not exist without an object, love, correct? So God has to actually be a family. And that's probably the greatest revelation to understand what God is like. We see it revealed there, uh, John chapter 17, which we'll refer to uh, time permitting. You see how the Son, everything in His life is aimed at bringing glory to His Father. That's what drives Him. It's why... It's why he suffers humiliation and deprivation. It's why he suffers what had to be a crushing kind of solitude where even the ones that he loved so much couldn't even understand what he was doing. But he had to do it, though, in order to get to us. But he did that in order to bring glory to the Father. And every time that the Father speaks, you know, he's sharing that glory, just pouring it out on his Son. That's how that operates. That's the way. So in the beginning, before there was time, God, who is a family, decided to expand His family. That means that there is no person anywhere, and there is no person in this room who wasn't already desired. Do you understand? You. Put your name on it. You personally. Now, God made a place for you Go to prepare a place for you. Not a physical... Look, we don't need a physical space. You can describe, which God does. He describes the New Jerusalem in terms of miles. What's a mile to a spirit, right? That's a handle for us to hold on to. Those things are difficult to ascertain as we're so limited by our, this fleshly vessel that we occupy for the moment. But... The place that we have, it's in His family. And nobody else has it. There is no other you. Now this freed me from a million chains. I don't compete with anybody. I don't compete with anybody. Because there is no other me. God made me just like I am. For His pleasure, because it makes Him happy, that's why. That's exactly why. And that is the happiest thing that I know. To think, you know, as we heard Pastor say today, right before we sang, give me Jesus, when he said, Lord, we want to put a smile on your face. That's how I feel. And when I feel his smile, my whole world lights up. I just, 
I would give anything for that. That's what he wants now. That's what it's all about. So if you're giving a wedding banquet, then you take care to prepare a place. I I think of Sarah's wedding and Jenny's wedding, Elizabeth's wedding. Oh, their husbands are involved too. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to name them. You know, there was a lot of work that went into preparing a place because they wanted the place to be special. This is a special thing. It doesn't happen all the time. I mean, people worked like Trojans, overhauling everything so that it would be the right kind of environment that would, that would be suitable to an event that is that momentous, that precious, as we learn from Paul. And it is a deep mystery. I mean, maybe it's the deepest mystery that I know, that marriage itself, you see, that's, that's a mere shadow. It's a lesser reflection of a greater reality. That's why, that's what it says in the Word. It literally is what it says. I mean, when Jesus said that in the beginning God made them male and female, He did that for a reason. Paul said, look, this is a great mystery, but I'm telling you, it's about Christ and the church. That's why God made people male and female, to reflect something that is very real. And so a lot of work went into making that space beautiful. And then, now you think about it, the the anticipation, the joy that's already there for the expected event. That means that everything, how do you want people dressed at a wedding? Don't you want them in their best? Because it befits the occasion, isn't that true? I mean, we all get dressed up for weddings. Right? And you're careful about things like the invitations. Now, th- I know this because I narrowly escaped marriage like by that much, much earlier in my life. But there was a lot of thought that went into, now what pattern do we pick? And what bond paper do we use? And what, I'm sorry, yeah, I know. Look, that's part of what makes God happy. I'm cheesy, so I'm like that. You think about what script that you use and you send those invitations out. And the whole time, You guys know what it is. I know what it is to prepare for somebody the whole time your mind is is fixed on that event. And usually at those kinds of events, the people that you invite, they're the people that you love. Isn't that true? Which is kind of the point. It's that fellowship and that you want that intimate experience. You want that shared amongst the ones that you love. And then you're together and you celebrate that event. And that's, that's what you do. So, here we are. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a feast. It's a banquet. Now, the Lord made this occasion before there was time. That's the truth. His heart has been fixed on the moment that this represents, and look, every other holy day too, I understand that there's a succession involved, but you also understand that when we touch the heavenlies and God manifests His presence at these holy times, it's all, it's as we heard earlier, it's the consummation, isn't it, of all things? So we know that what we have entered into here is seeing the Lord face to face. As we heard just earlier this morning, no barrier, no separation, no fear, no tear, no pain, right? Fullness of joy, pleasure that won't stop, just won't ever stop. Now, we we touch on that in this moment. He planned for this moment. And a lot of times when you do weddings, you have gifts that are given. So I'll just share this with you. I've seen it so much now, it is my expectation that when we approach these holy times, I've seen that the Lord has gifts laid aside for us, that He's prepared this place for us in love. And I think in terms of what gift can I give to Him, we all do. Look, we prepare it. We give an offering, that's worship. 
And as we heard, it was mentioned, always comes up, the widow's might. You know what impresses me about the widow's might? That blessed the Lord. That's what impresses me about that. I'm, I don't, and I never have been the kind of person that's geared much. Honestly, it's like I'm a misfit for the material world in so many ways. I rarely know the day it is, what time of day it is. I'm, I'm not thinking in terms of how many dollars or how many pennies and stuff like It's not how I'm geared, right? And it, it wouldn't have mattered what the sum was. You know what Jesus saw? He saw somebody that loved him with all that she had. That's what he saw. And that's exactly the love that he had for her. Because what was he giving? Everything. What was the Father giving? Everything. You see? That was, a, that was an unmitigated, un, undiminished, pure, free-flowing, full love back on a circuit. You know, we love him because he first loved us. That's what's so impressive about that. So I think, Lord, what heart can I bring to you? And when it happens, which it will always happen, those of you who have done this many times, you know it. You expect it now. You're going to get hammered before the feast comes up. It's going to happen. It is necessary, and it's good. The Lord does good things with that. But you're going to be sifted a little bit. You're going to be punched a little bit. It is necessary. It purifies you. You know, when I feel those, those blows that the enemy is being used as a tool to deliver to me, I try to bear in mind, this purifies my heart. This intense heat that I'm feeling is burning away impurities that the Lord finds repugnant and that do not, they do not befit one who is holy, such as myself, nor the holy object of my affection either. So praise the Lord for those things when they come. That is actually a gift being prepared that we get to offer to Him, you see. You know, as we heard a little bit earlier, this, this is part of what, how marriage works. But what the Word says is that the husband says, look, this body, it's not my own. This is yours. This is for you. Isn't that what Jesus said? That's right. We're his bride. We say the same thing to him. Lord, it's yours. Just do whatever you want. If it'll bring you glory, do it. If there's something I'm holding on to that's robbing you of some joy, take it. Do what you want. Please, I, I want what you want. I'm thinking about that. I want whatever it takes for you to do in me for me to praise like nobody's watching. I know you guys can see me. I sit up front, or at least, well, maybe you can't. If I stood on a chair, you could see me. I don't care. I don't. I don't care. Because, you know, I'm looking at the face of my Lord. I'm looking into the eyes of my Heavenly Father. And that's the audience that I consider. And that's why I don't feel silly or goofy, you know, which is what my flesh would do because I didn't grow up in a tradition where you raise your hands or where you clap, but far be it from me to withhold that from my Lord. It makes Him happy. That's what my aim is. That's what my purpose. So I think about what gifts and things, you know, that I get to give to Him. But also, and I, I hope this doesn't sound too Christmassy, I never did celebrate Christmas, thank the Lord, but you know, the kids, they make out lists of things that they want. I do that with the Lord, I do. Now I do it at, at the spring holy days a lot of times because that's a time, it's a beginning time. It's a good mile marker for me to mark. But I especially have my eyes on this time because I've seen the Lord do so many powerful things. And so I will write down for myself, Lord, and look, I'm not asking him for big screen TVs. I don't care. I don't. I'm asking for things like, deliver me from this crippling way of seeing things, Lord. If there is a root of bitterness, how many times have you discovered because the Lord showed up, there's something in you that you did not know was there? So many times. The Lord knows. I'm saying, get that out. 
I'm aware that I have, if the Lord gives me three score and ten years, I've got slightly less than 8,000 days left to give, and that's all, just as Michael said in his message, you know? We only have so many days, and in those days, there are only so many real milestone moments, you know? where you're under real tribulation or persecution, which is a moment where you, as an earthen vessel, like the alabaster flask, you can be broken, and that what is perfumed to anoint Jesus' feet can pour out. That's your love. And I mean love when it counts, right? Love when it's hard. Love when it takes faith, you see. That's precious, and you know how I know it. This is how I know it. Because look at all the wonderful things Jesus did. Who can count them? They're not all recorded for us. Some of them He shows us in the Spirit. I love them all. The thing that I love the most about the Lord, it's the gauntlet of hell that He went through to rescue me. Because my trouble was real. I felt it. I was in a foul, dark, dank, deep prison and I was cut on my bonds and striving so hard, blindly, just flailing to get free and I could not free myself in any way. I had no power to free myself. And he saw me that way. And he decided I'll give up everything to rescue you, son. You mean that much to me. I will. And every insult, every pain, every anguish, all of that. Look, don't pass right over the Scriptures that say that He offered His prayers up with tears and with loud groaning. That's distress now. That's not, you know, Father, in, in Your all-knowing wisdom, please rescue. No. No, He cried for me. He gave up His dignity for me. He was broken for me. He felt the bitter sting of betrayal for me. And he got to me. All of the gifts that he gives to me, they're precious. But the thing that is the most precious to me is when it cost him the most. You see? Well, I mean, just do the math. Isn't it true then for him? Don't you think those are the most precious things that we get to give to him? And those things amass, don't they? I mean, that's what it says, the Word says. You store up treasures in heaven. Store them up. Paul referred to every person that was saved because of his ministry as his joy and crown. What is it we're going to put at Jesus' feet when we do that? Will it be those who because of the light of Jesus, like Galatians 2.20, you know, I'm crucified with Him. I'm not even the one who's living. What you see now living here, this is Christ living through me. We are one. And all of those who are touched by that light, I mean, those are treasures to Him. That's precious to Him. If you will, turn with me. And I know that the Lord wanted this message preached because He's already preached it. So this is review. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Just go to Genesis 1.14. We already referenced 1.26. So, here just quickly it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. So, we talked about invitations to a feast, right? And how we carefully select the invitation so that, so that it befits the honor, the glory of the occasion. So here, where it says for signs and for seasons, as we already heard, the word for seasons is moedim. That means to this sacred, holy assembly. Now, I've never been summoned to a castle by a king, but I have been summoned to Mount Zion by the king of the universe, though. Now, what sort of an invitation would befit such a thing? The gathering of the ages. Something that literally is the consummation of everything that he's doing. Well, now you see that? That the Feast of Tabernacles, the words are emblazoned on? And there you have your stars. Those are lights in the heavens. God made them more exquisite than the most exquisite watch. 
Anybody who studies them stands in awe. You cannot deny that God put that together. It is the most exquisite, finely tuned mechanism ever. No one has ever touched it or come close. The stars literally are made first. Now, not even second. Second for day and for night. That's secondary. The first thing they are is an invitation to you written in lights in the heavens. Brighter and more sparkling than the finest jewel. And we've all been invited, come. Come to Mount Zion. Come to my presence. Come and be with me where I am. Let's turn quickly to Revelation 13, 8. I know that it's already been referenced, but it is important. So we received the call, but here's the thing. Aren't we a little like Cinderella in the natural now? I'm not talking about who we are in the spirit. In the natural, how is Cinderella going to go to the ball? She can get the invitation, and that already, that's crazy. Because who is she? I mean, she's just a, a chambermaid. She's the lowliest of servants. That's us in the natural, in the flesh. Nobody's inviting me to palaces. Nobody was going to, but she did. Beyond all hope or expectation, she received the invitation, but now she can't go. She's just dressed in rags. She's covered in soot. So how can you go dressed in your shame? Right? You couldn't go. You'd die of embarrassment if you went that way. Well, the Lord understands that. Who is it that's able to stand in His presence as the psalm that we heard read? Right? That's what Revelation 13, 8 is about. And I know that it's a very quick statement, but it's a very, very deep thing. And you can keep searching it from now until glory and keep finding new things to understand. And it says, verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship Him. Everyone whose name has not been written in the found." not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Now, this is the NASB. Other versions say the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So, the, the order is slightly different. But this is the point. When did Jesus offer Himself? Right? When did the Father and the Son decide this is what we will do? When did they know we were going to find ourselves dressed in filthy rags. Like he knew from the beginning. There's no such thing as a surprise for God. So the provision was made to clothe us again, as we heard, in his righteousness that befits this occasion. Dazzling. That's the truth. Look, we know what he looks like. Do you ever consider that? Do you meditate on that as we heard described? It's already been read at this feast. Don't you just see him? Like when we sing, when we've been there for a thousand years, bright shining as the sun, that's face reflecting face. That's his glory, which is our glory, and we're going to share. And you see as he appears on the Mount of Transfiguration, dazzlingly blinding, white, radiant, radiant in his glory. You see Him with the golden sash and you see Him mighty and strong. And Don't you just... You have to love Him. I mean, it's, it's the most attractive thing that I know because I love that face and I love how He is for me, how He's strong and He's steady and He's merciful to me and He's patient and He's loving and He's kind and He always tends my wounds and He always heals me. And I just see all that summed up in that glorious appearance. But you know, He's going to have a glorious bride. That's us. So how do we enter in? How can we get through that veil? We had to provide for that. Isn't that what Abraham said to Isaac? When Isaac said, where's the sacrifice? He said, well, the Lord will provide. So we enter His presence boldly as is written in Hebrews. How? How could we? We're clothed in His righteousness. Have you considered this from the, the parable of the prodigal son? Now that's, that's us. We're the son. How the father feels about us, that's reflected in the father. Every day he's watching, watching. His every thought is bent on his son. He has no rest. He has no peace. 
Not until his son comes home. And he recognizes that his son is in torment until he gets home. What happens though? He shows up and the first thing that happens is what happens to all of us. Look, it happened to Isaiah. You know, it happened in Isaiah 6 where the first thing that strikes him is, I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I'm a man of unclean lips. And the Lord took a fire, a coal of fire, and touched his lips with it. He cleansed him. You know, or as we already heard about Joshua that's recorded for us there in Ezekiel. It's the same thing. Satan's accusing him, saying he's filthy. How can he come before you? He is filthy. You cast me out. How is he any better than that? And the Lord says, you put some clean clothes on him. You put my righteousness on him. That's what was provided for us. Oh, the blood of Jesus. How white did it wash our hearts? Completely white. No spot. Look, none. None. No blemish. Not a hint. Like the Hebrew children didn't even smell like smoke. That's us before the Lord. And that means that we are a radiant bride to Him. That's the price that He paid in order to dress us that way. In the example of the prodigal son, I mean, the father dressed him in festal robes. Festal robes. A robes befitting to a banquet, and then he declared a feast because that's what he likes. That's what this is. And he put the signet ring on him. It's just a picture. Look, it's a picture of what is really going to happen. Now, we already heard, so I'll just refer to it in John 14. Jesus says, Look, don't be worried and don't be worked up. You trust the Father, you trust me too. I am going. I'm preparing a place for you. Now, it is real in the now. It is real. But we only touch it through the Spirit. That place that's prepared to us, it's more. It's not a physical place. You see, whether you're on Nebo, or whether you're in your prayer closet, or whether we're gathered in the sanctuary in Russellville, whether you're in your car on your way to work, singing praise songs, well, where you are is very much a product of where your heart is, honestly. And you can be right there in the presence of the Lord through the power of the Spirit. That's what He has provided for us. It's accessible to us, which is a remarkable thing. But you see, He's preparing it. I don't know what all that means. I don't know. Think about how you prepare for a wedding. As we said, you think about the gift that you will give, right? Now, He knows what gifts we need. Uh, we don't even know. We don't know what to ask for a lot of times. And we heard spoken of in the first message how forgiveness works. You make a decision because you see the cross and you remembered you were that dirty thief next to Jesus mocking Him. And then He forgave you anyway. You know that you were the Roman soldier who was scourging Him with the flagellum. That is you, that is me. What was it that broke Him? What was it that ripped Him open? It was my sin and yours. That's what it was. Who wielded it? We did. We did. Who spat on Him? We did. Who cried out for His blood? We did. Who washed their hands of Him? We did. And He loved us anyway. So you make a decision based on that measure of mercy shown to us and understand we never have a right to hold any offense against anyone. There are two problems with holding it. First thing is you must believe that you're the aggrieved party. You're not. Now, we believe in God's standard, but God Himself is the standard. That's why David said in Psalm 51, against you only have I sinned. Which is weird because you would think, you didn't sin against Bathsheba? You didn't sin against Uriah? David knew ultimately it was God that he had offended. That all, every soul, including Uriah and Bathsheba, belonged to God. It was Him, you see. So that's first. We're not the aggrieved party. And secondly, 
you would have to, you would have to believe somehow that you want justice rather than mercy. None of us wants that. I mean, you think about that, right? You want justice? You ever want to just show up and say, okay, Lord, give me exactly what I deserve. What would that mean? Yeah, we all know. So in that sense, we forgive. But as John rightly mentioned, and as Pastor brought up, you do that by an act of your will. When you, you look at the cross and you decide, Father, I forgive them. Lord, forgive them. But now something may occur and you put it out of your mind so it doesn't occupy your mind. Maybe uh, something happens down the road and it brings that back up, right? It dredges that back up. Well, it's as simple as taking every thought into captivity. At that moment, like it's a brand new thing, you take that to the cross. and You remember what you did to Jesus and how He forgave you. And then you do it again. And if it comes up again, you do it again. In that sense, it's a process. How many times has that happened to me? Uh, not everybody in here knows my story. The quick version is I was really abused when I was a kid. For about a year, it was real intense. It was intentional. It was systematic. It was calculated. Now, when the Lord saved me, I gave everything that I knew of myself up to Him. Everything that He has shined a light on, I said, Lord, You take it. I don't want it anymore. You take it. But here's the thing. At different moments, then things will come up. I've had it happen while Big Daddy is preaching a sermon and maybe he's talking about some kid that was abused. And suddenly I start quivering and convulsing and I can't stop the tears. Now that old pain is being dredged up. Something left un... Well that hasn't been washed away yet, that I haven't relinquished yet. Maybe I'm not prepared to do it. I think the Lord is wise that He lets us do it in bites. You know? It's kind of like when you think of a space shuttle, if it's going many times the speed of sound, you don't want to turn that thing around on a dime. You might want to take a little time to turn it around. Otherwise, it'll break apart just from the G-forces. I think sometimes our hearts are like that. Like there's an amount that we're able to let go of at a time. And the Lord does that by steps. So when that comes up, and it comes up, that's a new opportunity for me to relinquish that, you see. But this is the point. He knows. You don't know. He knows what your heart needs. He knows where you're blind to it. He knows the cry of your heart. He knows what's working on or gnawing on you in the dark times, in the dark places. He understands. What kind of a gift do you think He has prepared for you here in this place, in His presence? Look, that washes it all away. Isn't that true? It just swallows it all up. And you walk in crippled. And you walk out whole. You see, you walk in hurt and you walk out rejoicing. You know? You come into His presence bitter and you go out a force for healing full of love. Those are the kinds of gifts. That's what I think of when I think preparing a place. And I pray for those things for myself, things I don't know about. You search my heart, Lord. You know. I don't know how to pray. You know me far better than I know me. And then I think about brethren that I know, people that I'm close to. And I think of things, especially those things that are what I would call serial things. I mean... Things where you watch and there's a pattern that's creating pain or maybe that's getting in the way. Literally, as I was praying through and, you know, I pray for the feast from right after the feast. It starts on the drive home. I'm just putting my mind where the Lord's mind is. That's all. I'm thinking together with Him about what He's going to do. That's all. But I'm already thinking, you know, Lord... This is the best I can think of. Would you do this? Would you break this free for this person? Or it could be like where you see a particular, maybe a financial bondage, something like that. And you say, Lord, please bless them. If there's something that you need to do in them, then work that in them so that they can receive a blessing. Or it may be physical healing. 
or it may be healing in relationships or whatever. There's so many, my mind is on it and I'm listening it to the Lord. And it's not a frivolous thing because the Lord's mind is on it too. He's preparing a place. He prepared this place. There are specific blessings, not just for this time, but for us, each one of you specifically, He has things. There are visions that He wants to open your mind to. There are words that He'll speak to your heart that will never leave you that will matter for eternity, precious things. There are moments of shared intimacy with Him that will change you forever. Like the Apostle Paul. Look, when you meet the Lord, you go away different. And there's nothing in this world that can stay shiny after experiencing the Lord's manifest presence. Let's go to John 17 and we'll, we'll close here. This is such an intimate moment, and I'm so thankful that the Lord invited us in to see this moment. 17, 22. Now consider this before we read that. So, you know, the Lord is our head. We're His body. Paul describes that in great detail. And we lift Him up. We honor Him. He is our head. That glory that He has... He shares that with us. So, how many times in scriptures does it talk about how the bride or the wife is a crown for her husband, adorning his head? We are his joy and crown. Now, I don't know what to do with that. Like, I really don't know what to do with that. But we rest on him like glory. And that's, a, that's such a wonderful thing. Think about the dichotomy between who the devil told you you were your whole life. Like you're a mess up. You're a, you're a mistake. Like you're a waste. I know we've all heard it. We've heard it in a million different ways. And we all believed it too before we heard the Lord. We all bought the lie and operated accordingly. But look at the real truth of it. Now there's nothing you can look at. Nothing. That's as valuable as you. Now, if you want to know how I know that, it's because of the price tag that's on you. That's how I know. You know? Not even the angels. I mean, there was no one sent to redeem them. You know, the Lord didn't shed His precious blood. We are, if you can receive it, we're the, the most precious thing that there is. And this room represents, I think that we heard this today as well, you know, most people ignore the Lord. It's, it's not rare that people will give him lip service. It's rare that people will actually give them their hearts. Trust him. Do what he says. Walk with him. Just walk with him. You know? I mean, God invites the whole world to his house every week. Most people don't show. Oh, but they go to his arch enemy's house every week and loudly proclaim Jesus' praises. Now that's a stench. I don't care how you slice it. That is a stench in his nostrils. It's an abomination. And he hates it. And we all know we would hate it too. You know, I've said it before. I'll just repeat it here. Look, I would rather you openly hate me. I can take that. Okay, that person hates me. All right. I don't need to go rethink my life. It's okay. Not everybody's going to love me. What I don't take so well is when people lavish praises and love on me and then hate me in their life, like how they act. Like that's worse, isn't it? Well, that's how most of the world is for the Lord. So that makes this gathering very precious indeed. So here in John 17, you know Jesus is about to give His life, His full measure of devotion, all the way to His dying breath in order to rescue and to heal us. And so you're looking into the deepest part of Him when He invites us to see His heart in this prayer. So we'll just focus on uh, verse 22 down to verse 24. He says to His Father, The glory which you have given to Me, I have given to them. Now you hear it? It's a past completed act. 
All right? Think about that. Are we waiting to be glorified? That's not actually right. We're not waiting to be glorified. We have been glorified, which is why the language is used in Romans 8, the unveiling, right? It's not the building of the glory. It's just the, the, the taking apart of the veil. That's all. We're in this earthen vessel. It can't be seen except through spiritual eyes who we really are in the Lord. But, I mean, the Lord says that. I've given that glory to them. So we are glorious. I don't know if you like the Song of Solomon, but it strikes a deep chord with me. And I, I feel like the Shulamite woman, you know? She keeps saying, I, I had to work in the field. You know, back then it was a mark of being beautiful if you had that beautiful porcelain skin, you know, untouched by the sun, just, just pale white like alabaster. That was the pinnacle of beauty in that day. And so this woman had to work out in the fields. Her hands were rough from work. And her skin was darkened by the sun. And she was saying, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not lovely. You know, I'm, I'm dark and my hands are rough. And he said, no, you are fair. You are so fair. See? Well, I mean, sometimes when we're evaluating ourselves in the flesh, that's what we're saying. We're saying, but, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very lovable. And that's not what he says about us now. That's not the truth. He says, no, you are fair to me. You are fair. You are a song to me. You delight my heart. You are beautiful to me. And he's right. Not those, not those lies and those feelings. So we're already glorified. That's what the Word says. And he says that they may be one just as we are one. Now again, I'll refer you to Ephesians. The point is that it's not going to be two families. I mean, God doesn't even consider that separate anymore. What could be greater than that? And even as we're here, now understand that it's true that we are unified, unified with Him, joined to Him, celebrating before Him, there's nothing in the way. I don't, know how, I don't know how to calculate this all the way out. So I'll just try to get at it maybe from an oblique angle. One of the things, given the revelation that we have concerning coming to Mount Zion, it's shifted the way that I think. So let's consider how the feast works. What happens is you go live your life. You attend to the business of your life, which entails a job and a house and lots of activities. And you do this for months and months. And it's broken up by a week in the spring where you take a break from your life and you have the spring holy days. And then you go on and then you have a break uh, for the summer holy days and then or holy day. And then in the fall, you take a break from your life and you, you visit for tabernacles. That's exactly backwards. So our life is hid in Christ. Isn't that what the Word says? It's where our life is. It can't be touched. It's where we live. In Him we live and we move and we have our being. We're already one with Him. We're already glorified. We live there. This place that we're inhabiting, and again, not physical space, spiritually speaking, these feast days, all that they represent, this is home. See? So that when we're, and it's not wrong. It's not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying when you are at work, when you are doing whatever else, that's the break. All right? That's visiting. This is home. That's one of the things that has come home to me. It's almost like Hmm. You know, it's like at the, at the feast we breathe. We breathe air. When we have to interface with the world, it is prosperous and beneficial. It brings the Lord glory. Children are saved. Prisoners are set free. All of that. But it's like you're holding your breath like that. And we hold our breath. But when we're with the Lord, we can finally breathe. Verse 23, I in them, you in me, 
that they may be perfect in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. One, the world will know that Jesus is the Lord, as he said, as he founded this ministry, if I be lifted up, I will draw them into me, right? So this is how they know. We're unified with the Lord. It affects who we are. It affects how we are. I mean, I've for a long time held in high esteem learning things, being able to communicate things. It's fine. That's fine. Those are trinkets. That's small. You know what's big? It's big having the glory of the Lord shed abroad in your hearts, being filled with love, acting as He is in this world. That's big. And He says it right here. So when we pray your kingdom come, we're not just saying eventually show up because he's going to do that. But that's not even what it's connected to in the Lord's prayer. You know, it's really connected to what you see when he says it. Look, if I healed you, if I cast out demons from you, then that means the kingdom has come. That means the kingdom has come. When children are set free and healed and delivered, that means that the kingdom has come. So there's that. But also... Look, He loves us. I hope you can hear that today. Now, it doesn't bother me a bit that that's really the ABCs. It's still, it's the most important thing that I know. It changes everything. Because you can either believe that God's intentions are kind, that His plans are good, or whether you do it tacitly, passively, or, or actively, you believe that he's out to destroy you, that he's a cruel and an evil tyrant. And it's so easy to slip into that mindset. And the way you know it is how you behave in the world. So he loves us just like he loves Jesus. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given to me be with me where I am so they can see my glory which you've given to me. And you loved me before the foundation of the world. What's driving him? He wants to be together. He wants to be together. He likes your company. It does mark an occasion. That's true. And we understand how these times that they picture what God is doing in this world. But you know, primarily, he wants the joy of your company. Just the way that that's what drives us. Who cares what style of music? Who cares? As long as the Lord is present there, you see. That is what is driving him. So I think that we'll just sum up. I, I know I didn't read it. You'll find in Luke 22 where Jesus talks about the desire that he had to eat that Passover with the disciples. The word there, desire... It's not strong enough, but we don't have a good word. If you want to think of it, what, like you might say, I desire some goal. Pick a goal. Well, the way that you're going to measure the intensity of that desire is what cost are you willing to pay? You know, for how long in order to get it? And that'll give you an idea of desire. So you've got all of the parables, like the pearl of, of great price or you know, the lost coin, that sort of thing. But so you think of what it took Jesus to get to that moment to sit at that table, see, which was a betrothal, by the way. What did he go through? Well, all the time, all time. We just read Revelation 13, 8. And the Lamb's been crucified from the foundation of the world. How long has he been suffering? Since the first rebellion. Not even just since man first rebelled. Since Lucifer first rebelled, he loved him too. Now there's torment, tor turmoil, torment, pain that didn't exist before. Disharmony, disunity, disorder. And he's had to bear that. And he also had to bear when Adam defected, he decided to believe his enemy, that God was out to get him, that he was holding him under his thumb, that he didn't actually love him, but that he wanted to destroy him. And he believed that lie, and he brought all the pain all the misery as a result of that. God has suffered the whole time. I don't know how to calculate how it feels for a parent to watch his children live in, in torment, mutilating each other. 
But that's what he's had to witness. And it's hard. You know, he waited till just the right time to come. So that's the time period. And he's still waiting for the consummation of all things. For us, he's not waiting. We're already with him. And what's the price? Well, what did he give, though? Well, you know, like, uh, like Moses, he gave up a palace, only his palace wasn't just marble like it is here. He gave up the courts of heaven, fiery stones, an emerald rainbow like a sphere encompassing him about, the chorus of the angels singing his praises, the glory that there is, the seraphim, uh, cherubim rather, overshadowing him in his throne. He gave up everything more opulent than anything we've ever known. Crossed all time. Suffered in a way that we don't know how to understand. We just glimpse it a little bit. That's when it says, I've earnestly desired. That's the level of desire that's on the other side waiting for us. And don't you find that as you progress through this world, the level of your hunger and desire also grows deeper. We groan for Him the way that He does for us. And He said that, you know, that He wasn't going to eat of the Passover or, or drink from that cup until we did it in the kingdom. Well, Welcome to the kingdom. So let's not, let's not let anything be in the way. Not us and not anything that's in the way. What the Lord wants to do, I don't know it all, but I know that it's all good. And I also know this. I don't want to deprive him like Bartimaeus, you know, that was, he was blind so that God would reveal his glory. Uh, I don't want to rob him of one praise or one healing, so let's just be sure that there's nothing in the way. Brian, will you come close to some prayer?